welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James and welcome to episode 12 of the Madden America podcast. This week, I'm honoured to have had the chance to interview Professor John Reed from the University of East London. Professor Reed worked for nearly 20 years as a clinical psychologist and manager of mental health services in the UK and USA before joining the University of Auckland, New Zealand, where he worked until 2013. He has served as Director of the Clinical Psychology Professional Graduate Programs at both Auckland and more recently the University of Liverpool. He has published over 120 papers in journals, primarily on the relationship between adverse life events and psychosis. John is on the Executive Committee of the International Society for Psychological and Social Approaches to Psychosis and is editor of the ISPS's scientific journal Psychosis. He is also a member of the British Psychological Society's Alternatives to Diagnosis Working Group. In this episode, we discuss Professor Reed's research interests, and in particular the science and evidence based for electroconvulsive therapy, or electroshock as it's known in the United States. Professor Reed, thank you so much for talking with me today for the podcast. Firstly, I wanted to ask a little about you and what led to your research interests, particularly the efficacy of ECT and psychotropic medications and the influence of the pharmaceutical industry on clinical practice. Well, I think I think my interest in sort of madness in general came from my own teenage years when, so many, like so many other people, I was pretty screwed up and... and um, Try to figure out, trying to figure out where that came from, and uh, so on, on a good day, I would feel like the rest of the world is completely insane, and on a bad day, I would feel like I was completely insane. And so, I ended up wanting to study psychology to try and try and make sense of myself and my family. And I'm, I'm not sure I ever did accomplish that goal, but um, so it's largely, I think, like so many other people who get into mental health, it's because of our own difficulties and issues when we when we're younger if we're if we're honest about it and I think that's that's true of many people in mental health. And John, you've written extensively about some of the issues both with medication based treatments for mental health and also ECT too. And I just wondered when it was that you started to feel that maybe all wasn't right with the way that we support people with their mental health. Well my my first my first experience in mental health services was what must be forty years ago now. Uh yeah, coming on. Uh, I was in New York as a as a nursing assistant in, in a psychiatric ward. It was my very first experience, and it seemed to me that if you could establish any sort of relationship with the, the people in there, they would pretty much all tell you about awful things having happened to them, and that's why they were messed up, and why they were either hearing voices or extremely depressed or suicidal. Or, but it struck me very early on that the, the psychiatrist didn't seem to be interested in any of that. And I couldn't make, I just couldn't understand that. I was very naive at the time. And I thought mental health services were about asking people what's going on in your life um, and how has that affected you and what help do you need? I didn't realize it was just about counting symptoms and applying uh, some sort of diagnostic label and then picking a color pill. And that was true 40 years ago. And, and sadly, it's it's pretty much true today um there's been some some improvement some pockets of excellence undoubtedly but by and large mental health services around the world are still ignoring what's going on in people's lives which i find astonishingly sad it is isn't it as if people struggling with their mental health isn't enough to label them and then apply potentially damaging treatments on top is not a good place to be I wanted to move on now to ask specifically about your research into the use of electroconvulsive therapy, or electroshock as it's known in the US. Could you help me understand firstly how ECT is used and the conditions that it's most often used to treat? Briefly, there's an interesting history to that because it started out as a treatment for uh, schizophrenia um, or for people with that diagnosis. I always have to say that because there's actually no such thing as schizophrenia scientifically. It's no, not a construct with any reliability or validity. But anyway, it was used on people with that diagnosis. And the original justification f- for its use, um, because as you will probably know, that it's designed to cause grand mal seizures, epileptic type seizures, which seems an odd thing um, for medicine to be doing when you've got one branch of medicine trying to help people not have epileptic fits and another branch of medicine, if it is a branch of medicine, psychiatry, and causing epileptic fits. But anyway, the the justification when it started back in the 40s was that people with epilepsy did not have schizophrenia and people with schizophrenia did not have epilepsy. 
Therefore, in their infinite wisdom, they decided, and you can read this in medical journals of the time, they decided that the cure for schizophrenia must be to cause epilepsy. At the same time, they were injecting people with seizure disorders or epilepsy with the blood of people diagnosed with schizophrenia. So this, this was the sophisticated beginnings of um, electroconvulsive therapy. Nowadays, it's not used for people with psychosis or labeled schizophrenia. It's, it's used primarily for people with depression. But actually, the best predictor of who gets it is, is not diagnosis at all. It's age and gender. So statistically, um, the most powerful predictor of your chances of getting it if you enter the psychiatric system is being female and over the age of 60. Um, in every country around the world, women are given it twice as often as men, and people over 60 are given it two to three times as often as people under 60. So that's really uh, the actual criteria in the real world of who of who gets it, which, before we get into the efficacy and, and safety of ECT, raises some interesting questions. Why are older women, in particular, receiving this so-called treatment? And I don't think psychiatry has ever come up with anything resembling an answer for that. In fact, they don't really like to discuss that. Um, the closest I've got to discussions about that are, are well, John, you see, uh, this is because older women are more depressed than uh, men or younger people. And then if you ask them why that is and whether it's related to loneliness and poverty and those sorts of things, they say, absolutely not. It's hormonal, which is then, then we realize we're speaking a different language and the conversation grinds to a halt. But... Um, historically, when it was first introduced, the other rationale for using it, other than the epilepsy theory, sorry, using epilepsy to cure um, schizophrenia, the other rationale was that some people with schizophrenia have very, very painful memories of traumatic events, and electricity, uh, ECT, can erase those memories. And you will read that in medical journals also, which is fascinating to me because I now spend most of my life trying to get psychiatry to adopt a trauma model of mental health and back in the 40s they had one uh, they acknowledged that these so-called mental illnesses were often caused by very severe trauma and memories them them and they they thought the best way to deal with that was to erase the memories by causing um, enough brain damage or enough memory loss but of course, as years went on, that was considered unethical. You couldn't acknowledge that you were using a treatment that set out to cause brain damage. And um, that, as ethical codes came in, um, they breached all of those, so they could no longer talk about that. And John, I've observed on social media and on news items and the like, some emotive and heated discussions on the use of ECT, particularly for depressive illness. And it's a topic that seems to be polarizing, particularly where anecdotal evidence is concerned. I wanted to ask you, what does our best science and evidence tell us about the use of ECT? Well, our best science tells us that after 60 or 70 years now, there has never been a single study showing that ECT is better than placebo beyond the end of the treatment period. So let me just unpack that a little bit. Um, during the treatment, which usually takes three to four weeks and involves on average, uh, eight to 10 sessions. During that period of time, a small percentage, roughly a third of people will gain some benefit, some lift of mood. Sometimes some of the studies that's only perceived by the psychiatrists and, and the patients and the families and the nurses can't see it, but the psychiatrists can, which is interesting. Um, usually it's a, a, a subsection of, of the people given it who uh, benefit at all. But even for that minority of people who receive some benefit in, in lifting their mood a little bit, that for all of them, that goes um, within two to four weeks of the end of treatment. There is no study um, beyond two weeks of the end of treatment showing that it's better than placebo. So you can get, um, for a, in a minority of people, a temporary lift of mood. And this kind of explains why some people... Um, not many, but some people will swear blind that it saved their lives and that they come back for more because they, they will get this temporary lift in mood, which then goes away very quickly. And then they, they want that lift again, that artificial lifting of mood, which, which some researchers have compared to the sort of mild euphoria you get with a minimal brain trauma, um, which is exactly what it is. And that's kind of emotionally, that's quite a nice feeling. 
so you can get this temporary lift of mood and, and people will come back some people will come back uh, again and again for that but scientifically there's um, just no evidence that it's better than placebo i should just explain what placebo is <clears throat> in this circumstance because obviously it's not a little pill with nothing in it a placebo in this instance is you give the anesthetic which accompanies all ect because without it it breaks bones because of the convulsions and not the electricity so the person might uh, believe that they have had the ect but they haven't mm, so that, okay. when you compare those two groups there is no difference beyond the end of treatment and what's amazing is that that fact simply does not interest the psychiatrists to continue to use it mm. they just I've had so many conversations over the years when you present that research to them they just look blankly at you and don't they don't they tend not to try and argue with you or say it's bad methodology they're just not interested and they say I know it works I've seen it works I'm not interested in your, the research you're telling me about John and that is uh, that positions them outside of science and most of us these days believe that medical decisions should be evidence-based not based on the personal opinion of individuals. I agree and John I think the listeners would be interested to know how do psychiatrists determine that the treatment has been successful for example is the brain scanned before and after in an MRI scanner or is it based on some other diagnostic test? Um, in terms of the depression that will be based on a questionnaire um, there's the, usually a Hamilton rating scale or a Beck depression inventory so, or, or sometimes this thing that they called a, a clinical judgment scale which is just which is simply the opinion of the psychiatrist, which, of course, is biased. The person who gives the treatment is the last person who should be assessing whether it worked or not, um, if you want anything, any sort of object objectivity. So, no, it's not based on any sort of CAT scan or MRI or anything like that. And it couldn't be because they don't know how it works. They wouldn't know what to look for. So there's, they've never really claimed that they know how this thing works. So uh, there wouldn't be any point giving a CAT scan, except... For the adverse effects the, and the brain damage, they should be um, scanning the brain, but they don't yeah. because they're also not interested in the adverse effects, which they say don't exist or are very minimal and very temporary, um, both of which are totally inaccurate. Thank you. And John, I've also heard the statement that ECT can prevent suicide. And again, I wondered if this was based on any supporting evidence. Not a single study, not one ever showing that uh, ECT is better than placebo to prevent to prevent suicide. There's a considerable amount of anecdotal evidence, and it is only anecdotal, that uh, some people have committed suicide after receiving ECT because of the memory loss and the fact that they can't do their jobs anymore. And the most famous of those anecdotal cases, of course, is Ernest Hemingway, who killed himself shortly after um, receiving ECT, and he wrote... It was a brilliant cure, but unfortunately we lost the patient, by which he meant he couldn't write anymore because of what it had done to his cognitive function and his memory. Um, but that is not evidence. That those are just stories. I mean, they're true stories, but they're not scientific mm. evidence. But there's certainly no evidence that it um, prevents um, suicide. So having determined that ECT is at best no better than placebo, you've mentioned that memory loss is quite common after ECT. And... Are there any other very obvious difficulties that people have once they've been through a course of ECT? No, not really. The major, um, I mean, there's lots of temporary ones like uh, quite severe headaches and confusion, disorientation, but those gen genuinely do go away after a few hours or days. So the only major sort of ongoing adverse effect is, is memory loss. And it, it, there's two types of memory loss that are caused by ECT. Uh, one is um, the loss of short-term memory, which is, you know, the capacity to remember new things. And the other is the loss of long-term memory. So people sometimes describe losing five, ten-year periods of their life. They can't remember getting married. They can't remember graduating from high school. Or, or they actually lose um, several years of their life. So everybody loses some memory after ECT. And for uh, some people, that memory slowly comes back. For other people, it doesn't. So very, very roughly, and because sadly they don't do enough studies on this, but roughly a third of people will have ongoing serious memory loss. And by memory loss, uh, by serious and ongoing, I mean memory loss are of a nature that can be debilitating in one's life, lasting for at least a year. And this, um, they don't like it when we call it brain damage, but I don't know what else to call it when it's a, a change to the brain that uh, causes 
long lasting or, or nearly permanent uh, memory loss. I think brain damage is the appropriate word to use. I don't know what else to call it. And John, there seems to be evidence of the increasing use of ECT. In April 2017, The Guardian reported that there's been a rise of 11% from four years ago and that on average individuals undergo more ECT procedures than before. So given the lack of clear evidence, the high relapse rate, the cognitive and memory impairment and the difficulty separating the effects of ECT from medications, why does psychiatry have faith in ECT? Uh, I, I'll just correct the increase um, bit there because The Guardian was wrong there and I did I had several conversations with their journalists. They're, those were sort of random non-statistical blips okay. in, the, in what is actually, it has plateaued it hasn't continued to go down since the 1980s. It has been dropping steadily in just about every country. And in the UK, it's starting to level out now. Um, and it may well start to go up, but it hasn't yet. Um, there are parts of the world where it's rising steeply. Australia for, is one which has gone completely down this uh, rather simplistic biological approach. It's adopting an American model, uh, much to the disadvantage of, Ameri- of Australian citizens. And uh, Texas also has gone a bit ECT crazy, shall we say. Um, but why does psychiatry continue to use it? Well, first of all, most of them don't. It's, I think it's revealing in its own right that very crudely a third of psychiatrists uh, think it's a wonderful thing. A third will use it very, very rarely as an absolute last resort, which is what the NICE guidelines say it should be used as. And a third will not touch it with a barge pole under any circumstances. Mm. Um, that tells you something in itself right there. I think that these these decisions are about personal opinions um, because if it, either a treatment works or it doesn't, and if it works, everybody should be using it or offering it. Um, and it tells you that some psychiatrists at least are interested in the research um, and are refusing to use it. Uh, and that's quite considerable numbers. You won't find anywhere near those numbers not using antidepressants or antipsychotics. So it's going to be fairly negative, the research, before that number of psychiatrists refuse to use it. So, But to answer your question as to why the psychiatrists who do use it use it, because they genuinely think it works, James. They, these are not bad people. They're not stupid people they genuinely believe it works and it's they see it working in in their mind's eye they they treat people who are extremely depressed extremely suicidal and yes giving people 150 volts of electricity to the brain can get people who haven't spoken for a while speaking or who haven't moved for a while moving and this looks like a cure to them and and they may not see those same, same people five or six weeks later when their depression is at the same level again or even worse the problem is you can get those sorts of results with cocaine or uh, not advocating that. I should add quickly. I'm just trying to make a point that it is not difficult to artificially lift somebody's mood. But if you do it in a way that does not address any of the reasons that the person's depressed in the first place, and you do it in such a biologically crude way as to apply 150 volts of electricity to brain cells that are equipped to deal with one thousandth of a volt roughly it's not you don't need to be a rocket scientist to know that this is going to burn out the brain cells quite literally so even though it does lift some people's mood it is absolutely not a safe way to do that it really does seem to be something based on faith rather than evidence indeed i think that's a fair description yeah but uh, but it's a genuine it's a i'm quite harsh sometimes on psychiatry i i I know that, but I think, so I have to say, this is a genuinely well-intentioned uh, thing that these people are doing. What I can't understand is that, you know, most people are well-intentioned towards people in distress, We like, but people who are um, medically trained should know that they must, as well as that well intention, must base their decisions on some research. They can't just do it on the basis of, what they believe to be the case. It's just not good enough, and it brings their their profession, the psychiatry, into disrepute. And John, I read in your literature review that there haven't been any placebo-controlled trials for ECT since 1985. Is that the case? Well, yes, 1985. Isn't that amazing? Um, and, and by 1985, that was the last one of the four that have ever been conducted, ever, that looked at comparing placebo with ECT after the end of treatment. And you would think if this was a real branch of medicine, um, if you've got a treatment that's been around for at that point for about 40 years, 
and we we haven't got a study yet that shows that it's uh, that it's effective you've got one of two pathways to follow one is stop using it b is invest a large amount of money in actually doing the research to demonstrate that it does work and psychiatry has done neither of those two things and they haven't done another study for the last 32 years that's uh not okay well, John, I had to read that fact several times for it to sink in, because given how much risk there is inherent in this procedure, I naively assumed that there was a mountain of science and evidence that carefully balanced the risks to the benefits. But your discussion paper completely blows that away. ECT really seems to be based on the flimsiest of science, doesn't it? Um, well, it's actually based on no science at all, is the bottom line. So yeah, there's no there's no science there. But we've had instances throughout history where this is been the case we just like to think that these days we don't do that anymore i mean we had two decades of lobotomies before that was stopped and at the time people were equally well intentioned and must have seen some benefits usually it was uh, along the lines of people who are very agitated and quite manic calming down which is what happens when you cause those sorts of lesions in the brain um but they thought that that worked for a while um, they did had no, they had no research evidence to support it, but they did it anyway. And then if you keep going back, you get the surprise bath, the rotating chairs, the bloodletting, and and so forth. And people said, John, what's that got to do with what's going on today? Don't be silly. And I say, well, it's got, got everything to do with what's going on today because we have no evidence for this, and we're doing it anyway. And I'm quite sure that in 20 years' time, there will be a, a radio interview taking place like this when we look back on ECT. And it'll be in the same basket of ridiculous, failed attempts to deal with madness as lobotomies and rotating chairs and surprise baths. It'll it'll be in that basket. And the sooner the better. I agree there, John. And hopefully we can also critically review the liberal prescribing of many psychiatric drugs, too. Indeed. And I think I think the answer to all of these issues is is the principle of informed consent. So although, although personally, I uh, I do advocate for the abolition of, of ECT because it's just so far beyond science and ethics. Um, but when it comes to other things, I tend to sort of think that we should rely on that issue of informed consent, whereby people should have the right to take um, various medications if they have been told fully what the pros and cons are. And if they have been offered alternatives, that's what informed choice means. Um, and uh, in terms of ECT, if people were genuinely told the chances of memory loss um, and death, which we haven't come on to yet, um, I don't think anybody would, would take it. Except, except having said that, sometimes people get to such a low point that they will try anything. Uh, and that's understandable. But um it's still very important that they're told fully what the what the evidence says. So I should just mention the, the, the death rate from ECT, um, which is uh, low, but it's significant. Um, and the major causes of death from ECT, unsurprisingly, are cardiovascular failure, given that um, you are causing a grand mal seizure and you are having a general anaesthetic. I mean, the general anaesthetic by itself has a, a very, very low rate uh, chance of death. Um, and this is what psychiatrists say is the rate of death. They say it is the same rate as the rate of general anaesthetics, which is negligible. And immediately you realize that they're playing silly games with something very, very important because you tend to get eight ECTs within three weeks and therefore eight general anaesthetics within three weeks. So there's a, a multiplying of the, the risk of death right there before you even get into the deaths from cardiovascular failure. So it, it is small, but it is uh, definitely a significant risk. Um, and that is never mentioned to anybody receiving ECT. And I think that borders on negligence. Well, the news stories that I've seen over the last few months were big on the anecdotal experiences, but much less so on the lives tainted, ruined and even ended by having this procedure. That's right. And, and, I, and I, I actually believe it, it and at an individual level, it's, it's possible that it can save somebody's life because placebo effects are very, very real and, and for this sort of procedure, very effective. I mean, to go, it's almost like having a, an operation. I mean, you, there's a theatre, you're rendered unconscious, there's lots of nurses around, there's a doctor around. This is a big procedure. So obviously, you're going to believe that it works. People would not do this to you if it didn't work, would they? And when you're feeling depressed, you badly want something to work. 
um, placebo works in terms of creating expectations. And that's not a bad thing at all. Uh, a lot of what us psychologists do is, is uh, building people's expectations and building up hope. That's not a bad thing. Uh, that's, when it does work, that's how it works. I've been through this treatment. I must be feeling better. Oh, I'm, I am now feeling better. I know it sounds strange, but people, we can talk ourselves into feeling better. If, and we all know that's sort of, in a way, a cornerstone of cognitive therapy is, is to replace negative thoughts with positive thoughts and, and the cornerstone of positive psychology. So it's important what we tell ourselves. So if we go from there's no hope for me, there's no hope for me, it's all over, to I'm having this treatment, obviously it's going to help me. And I yes, oh yes, I am noticing that I do feel better now and again. So placebo is is a real thing and it's and it's important. And if ECT didn't have all these awful side effects, um, these depressing side effects of, of losing one's memory, then I, I wouldn't be banging on about it like like I do, because I um placebo is is okay, but what isn't okay is causing brain damage. We're all for these things having benefit, but it's quite clear when you weigh the potential for harm against the potential small, likely transient benefit that you might get, the equation just doesn't balance, does it? Not really, no. John, thank you. And was there anything else that you'd like to share with the listeners? Just briefly, though, the next thing coming down the pipeline as ECT fades out, well, it will it will fade out, is this new approach of for using low levels of electricity to, to stimulate people's brains when they're feeling depressed. Is that TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation? That's the one. And that probably will work for some people along the same lines, as I mentioned before, of it's not difficult artificially to stimulate the brain, either chemically or, or, or electrically. And just worries me a bit, there's a sort of 1984 element element to it where you can picture people because people can do this themselves they can just have a little trigger in their pocket or a little button in their in their pocket where they can sort of give their brain a bit of a buzz if they start feeling a bit low and and it just scares me the idea of you know people walking around the streets electrocuting in their own brains if they feel a bit sad and uh i don't know that that um, sort of does does worry me about the future I, I, not only for those individuals but for society at large because i think if you look at it at a political level or a societal level if we've got large numbers of people walking about depressed and if we take our antidepressant prescription rates as a guide to how many people are depressed then we have about uh, one in ten of us are sufficiently depressed apparently that we need antidepressants if we have large numbers of people walking around depressed then we really really need to be asking questions about what's wrong with our society uh, that so many people are depressed, uh, and why, for instance, women are twice as depressed as men, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We need to be asking those questions, not asking how we can artificially zap people's brains so we don't ever feel sad anymore. Um, that that kind of scares me. But um, that's why I say it's in the future. But they are they're rolling out quite a lot of research around that. We seem to be obsessed with finding a cure for depression, don't we? And of course, I'd love to find something to help people like me that do suffer with their mental health. But while we continue to focus on ketamine and TMS and other things, we perpetuate the myth that these difficulties have a biological basis when there's no evidence for that. I, I, I think so. I, but I start from the premise, a completely different premise from some of these people, of course. They, they start from the premise that depression is caused by a thing called depressive illness. Mm. Um, and that's why we have this depression, because we've got depressive illness, um, which is a sort of backward circular loop, um, which is kind of a bit primitive i think doesn't really explain anything it's like saying when i feel happy that's because i have happiness syndrome which causes me to feel happy which is just it's just rubbish really it means nothing so i i start from the, the equally simple supposition that depression is largely caused by depressing things happening not entirely uh, because some people can have the same depressing thing happen and feel sad for one day, and the next person with the same depressing thing will feel sad for a year. So obviously we have individual differences, but if we lose sight of the fact that there's a lot of depressing things going on in our world, some avoidable, some not avoidable, avoidable. I mean, people die and, and, and things happen that are very, very sad. Um, but that's not an illness. It really, it's not an illness, and I think we go down the wrong route once we start assuming that we can identify bits of the brain that are causing our depression and uh, the myth of the chemical imbalance has now been totally blown out of the water in the last five years 
Um, many of us have been pointing out that it was a drug company invention for 20 years, but now we have the research showing that it's just not there. There is not a chemical imbalance that causes depression. But um, millions of people have swallowed that lie. Um, and it's a, in a way, it's a slightly comforting lie because it means we haven't got to deal with the depressing and messy things in our lives. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a simpler and in some ways easier thing to deal with. You know, there's something just a bit wrong in my brain. But then it, it kind of doesn't encourage you to do anything to make things better, does it, if you think there's something wrong with your brain? John, thank you so much for chatting with me. It was a fascinating discussion as usual. Thanks, James. Uh, pleasure as always. I'm so grateful to Professor Reed for taking the time to talk with me, and you can find links to the articles we discussed by visiting maddenamerica.com and looking under the podcasts section. Madden America News and Updates On Madden America, we wanted to let you know that on September the 12th, family therapist Marilyn Wedge and psychologist Gretchen Lefevre Watson will present an MIA continuing education webinar on non-drug interventions for youth diagnosed with ADHD. Nationally respected psychologist and family therapist Dr. Gretchen Lefevre Watson and Dr. Marilyn Wedge will show research that contradicts the mainstream conceptualization and treatment of ADHD in the United States and offer alternatives to psychiatric drugs for effectively resolving challenging behaviors at school and home. The webinar will be held on September 12th at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, and 5 p.m. British Summer Time. The webinar will last for approximately 90 minutes, and registration is $20. The course is designed to educate mental health professionals as well as the general public. To find out more and to register, visit maddenamerica.com and use the link at the top right-hand side of the homepage. So thank you for listening today. Please come back next week for another episode. And until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views and updates.